natural options using complementary and alternative approaches. We hope that you'll join us in this exploration, an exploration that may save you or a loved one a lot of needless suffering. Welcome, my name is Jeff Darcy. I'm director of the Darcy Wellness Clinic. I'm an acupuncturist and herbalist. And with me today in this studio are my guests, Dr. Arthur Gertler. Welcome, Arthur Gertler. Thank you for having me here. And uh, Yuan Ling Liu, who's an acupuncturist, herbalist, and registered dietitian, also at the Darcy Wellness Clinic. So today we want to talk about gastro, gastrointestinal health. What are the main problems? I mean, you've been for 30 years uh, a gastroenterologist, and now you, you're using uh, mainly you're using alternative approaches to those same problems that you use drugs for all those years. So as a holistic physician, what are, the, what are the main problems that you see in your practice? Well, we see the same types of problems you would see in any ordinary internal medicine or GI practice. Irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea, constipation, and abdominal pain. Uh, we see chronic hepatitis and uh, uh, stomach ulcers, especially in people that have had side effects or cannot take the standard medical drugs used for these. Yeah, so if we could uh, go to our slide. So the major uh, gastrointestinal complaints, there's a gastrointestinal <laughs> Uh, tract in, in, in all its glory. But the major problems are abdominal pain. You know, a lot of people come in with stomach ache. Is that what they, they would say generally into your practice? That they have stomach ache, uh, constant or irregular diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and gastroesophageal reflux. So tell us a bit about what is gastroesophageal reflux. Well, the uh, medical name is called GERD, G-E-R-D, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it's simply the heartburn that many people experience. Reflux of stomach contents, especially acid, from the stomach through a valve that's supposed to be working and closed to make a watertight uh, barrier which opens up and is loose in people with GERD. And it refluxes up the esophagus to produce the irritating symptoms of heartburn. So we see GERD now on, on you know, so many TV ads, there are so many drugs. So those drugs, what are the side effects of those drugs? Well, they can be serious side effects, although many people are not aware of the side effects. They aren't necessarily clinically evident, but neutralizing and preventing secretion of stomach acid for long periods of time is not a very good physiologic uh, state to be why, in. Why is that? Just because we don't, the body gets used to not producing stomach acid, and then it's not breaking the food down well? So that's part of it. Certainly the body can adapt to that, but it doesn't adapt well. Yeah. Uh, the acid is used, one, to start the digestive process in the stomach. It's used to activate uh, secretion of digestive juices in just beyond the stomach, the duodenum. But also the acid is necessary for the proper absorption of all our minerals, especially calcium and iron, and contribute, can contribute over the long term to iron deficiency anemias, especially in women. So really not absorbing the nutrients, not breaking down the food well or, or absorbing right. the nutrients well. Right. As well as osteoporosis. So osteoporosis, anemia, you say. Anemias. Yeah. And also we need our uh, adequate uh, acid-base balance produced by the acid in the stomach downstream to have a normal amount of digestive enzyme function as well as a normal balance in bacteria and organisms in the large intestine. It's very important. Uh, for the pH to be regulated by stomach acid. So some of the problems that you would be, you know, the leaky gut would be one problem that's becoming more prevalent or, or heard about these days. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little, a little later. We have uh, the idea of stomach acid depleting. <clears throat> St does stomach acid normally deplete with age? Yes, it does. And the studies have shown that people over their age 50, and many of these people do not produce adequate or any stomach acid and uh, elimination of food allergies. I imagine you must see a lot of food allergies. Oh yes, it's very important. It's both an inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, as well as irritable bowel syndrome, gallbladder disease, it's the whole panoply. Yeah, and uh, uh, Yuan Ling, <coughs> excuse me, as a registered dietitian in your work there, you must work a lot with food allergies. How do you approach that? Do you wrote, I've heard about rotation diet, maybe you could explain a little bit about how to approach food allergies. Well, uh, unfortunately, food allergies that you you know your body unable to uh, handle certain uh, uh, component from food. So, 
the most we can do is eliminating, finding out what you're allergic to and eliminating. And uh, the other things that uh, acupuncture and herb that can uh, work with um, allergies that, you know, sometimes we have a weakened digestion tract. Uh, when we are able to strengthen by using herb and acupuncture, uh, they might be able to tolerate better, have less symptoms. Some people are very broad allergies. Um, they, you're, you're simply unable to identify one thing that's causing all their symptoms. So um, just by eliminating, a lot of people can only have very limited uh, food choices. Uh, so, you know, we're looking into different kind of treatment to manage better. Right, right. <coughs> to improve the digestion as well as take out any irritants in the system. We could go to our, our next slide. So, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Arthur, there's Mr. Miller, <laughs> has a bowel trouble. <laughs> so, if we go to our uh, next slide after that, irritable bowel syndrome. Can you tell us a, a little bit about that? And, uh, there are some herbs, you know, that the treat that very well uh, upon the slide right now is turmeric, a ma major anti-inflammatory for IBS, uh, marshmallow root, which is kind of soothes over any inflamed mucous membrane, dioscorea, which is a, a Chinese herb that has a major antioxidant activity in the uh, colon, uh, slippery arm, which is also another kind of uh, uh, smoother or demulsifant that covers and protects any irritated mucous membrane in the that can be inflamed in, in, or, or irritated. And chamomile, I, mean, I, think, I think everybody knows that chamomile is used by many cultures in, in, in the world, Egyptian, Italian, that uh, have used it for centuries to help calm down. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, irritable bowel syndrome? Yeah, it's a uh, very common disease uh, characterized by diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain, or some combinations of uh, those uh, in which the overall effect physiologically is increased uh, what we call abnormal motility or contractions of the uh, hollow GI tract, the small and large intestine. So it's not moving the food through? Right, right. And uh, we do know that this is often associated with food allergies, also with something that we term dysbiosis or the abnormal balance of bacteria in the large intestine right, right. and fungi. So pro probiotics, you know, are good bacteria, right? So the idea is that pharmaceutical drugs, uh, food additives, uh, even stress can wear down our normal good bacteria that help, help the digestion in the digestive tract. So how do we replace them? Well, could you tell us a little bit about probiotics? Yeah, the probiotics uh, usually consist of uh, different types of species of lactobacillus and bifidus, which are very healthy and have uh, good biochemical and physiologic actions in the large intestine to absorb vitamins. And when they're used, ingested on a uh, daily basis, they don't actually colonize the large intestine, but they exist for a short period of time for the day you ingest them. And they prevent the uh, uh, accumulation of what we call pathogenic bacteria from doing their damage and creating leaky gut or what we call dysbiosis imbalanced bacteria and having an effect on motility. You know, I, I, I really understood uh, the qualities of, of probiotics when I, uh, a friend of mine invited me to go and, and see his friend's fish farm. And they had this big, huge fish farm. And generally what happens is these huge tanks, when they move these fish from tank to tank, they would put, conventionally they would put antibiotics into the water because the fish scales would rub against each other and cause an infection and they would lose 5% of their crop. But what my friend's fish company did in a holistic fashion, instead of adding antibiotics, they would add probiotics. And by increasing the good bacteria in the water, they would reduce the, by 3% the number of infection, just the same as with uh, antibiotics. So the antibiotics kill off the bad bacteria and keep more fish alive, and the probiotics increase the good bacteria and keep the bad bacteria in check. So I really started to understand that we need to increase the good bacteria in order to keep the bad bacteria in check in our intestines especially. So replacing them on a regular basis is something that you recommend to your patients for oh, yes. irritable bowel syndrome. So what are some of the recommendations as an acupuncturist and herbalist you, that you make to your patients? 
for, um, first of all, IBS, we all know, uh, we don't know what is actually caused IBS, and uh, there, physiologically, there's nothing wrong if you do a colonoscopy. Um, so, the main contributor... So there's no functional problem no functional found problem, by you're right. no or a, any of the conventional medical tests. Right. Yeah. So, um, the big contributor is stress. Uh, in this society, you know, we're constantly on the go, we're eating fast, eating irregularly, um, also eating, you know, too much of one thing, or overeating, undereating. So there are a lot of physiological stress, emotional stress, you know, we all know when we are under a tremendous stress, our blood flow doesn't go to the intestine, they mainly goes to the lung and heart, so we feel the shorter breath, heart palpitation, that's under stress. So you can imagine long period of time under stress, there are less blood circulation to the intestine. Our intestine functions, for example, producing you know, digestive enzyme, acid are being declined because, yeah. because it's not being supported. So our biggest recommendation for uh, IBS is that stress management. Uh, acupuncture is really good in terms of um, relaxation and also um, there are a lot of studies have done during relaxation uh, with acupuncture treatment. You know, our body um, are um, producing a lot more healing, um, you know, endorphins, so uh, different hormones. So the idea that the function of digestion in terms of even though conventional medicine testing doesn't find anything wrong with the functionality of the intestine. According to Chinese medicine, as an acupuncturist myself too, we both find that the digestive system may be under-functioning according to tongue diagnosis or pulse diagnosis of traditional Chinese medicine. So the idea of raising up intestinal energies, raising up you know, the digestive energies of the body makes those functions more or improves those functions Definitely. so that those symptoms decline. Right, so when we're under stress, there are, um, there are less blood f uh, flow and also there's also constricted energy flow. For example, when we are upset, we get yeah. stomach yeah. not tight You hear so many people up. say that that's Definitely. their weak spot when they get upset. It immediately, you know, they have a, a nervous stomach is the common right. expression too. Right, so they either get diarrhea or some people have a lack of flow, so they become a constipation. However, if you uh, look, some of the constipation is due to lack of mo movement. Uh, they uh, have a bowel movement, but they have a lot of incompletion. Yeah. They have a small yeah. bowel movement throughout the day, so that's already showing sign of a decline function of the, in, uh, the digestion uh, organs. Yeah. Uh, so that we call a deficient, rather than something is uh, Access people overeating yeah. had a mental, uh, emotional stress, and they'll have bouts of diarrhea that's have a lot of access sign. What are the access sign? Are you know the stool have a lot of uh, you know odor, and uh, also there are a lot of pains and cramps. Yeah. Uh, we consider that's um, access. So we have a different treatment uh, treating that's deficient or what's what's uh, access. Yeah. Uh, which uh, Western medicine doesn't address something like that very uh, well. So at, as a, a, a gastroenterologist of 30 years, what would you say is one of the, uh, you know, one of the natural uh, elements that you bring to your treatment plan today that gives you greater success with irritable bowel syndrome than you used to have as a conventional gastroenterologist? Well, I think combining the concepts that Yan Ling was talking about, that you were looking at the whole picture, yeah. not just the structure, which we know there's nothing wrong with the structure, but in terms of testing for food allergies, testing stool cultures for the abnormal organisms and treating that. And there's also recent uh, very interesting evidence that uh, we now know that uh, neurologic transmitters are more plentiful in the uh, GI tract than they are in the brain. For example, the serotonin, which is so common in depression, and we can replace these, and we can see some dramatic effects in people with irritable bowel syndrome. So we have to individualize, but we look at the, the whole panoply, and of course we treat diet too. Right, if we could go to our, our next slide, um, where the idea of you know acupuncture, there's one study that shows that acupuncture in uh, uh, 2000 was effective for the treatment of IBS. So there's quite a, quite a bit of information coming through now. We as acupuncturists know 
that we treat irritable bowel syndrome relatively successfully. I mean, we, you know, it's one of the common, one of the, one of the problems we commonly get good results with, both with herbs and, and with acupuncture. And uh, one of the tools that we use is tongue diagnosis, which if we went to our next slide, we'd have a, an example of one of the clues that Chinese medicine picks. It's pretty ugly looking tongue, you might think. Okay. <laughs> so well, what's that telling us in traditional Chinese medicine that's associated with depleted Right, so sometimes it's very interesting. You notice some people actually brush their tongue. Uh, yeah, very a, common. A healthy uh, tongue, you shouldn't have to do, uh, do anything with it. So the, the tongue is actually a map of the internal organ. You know, um, a normal tongue should be pink, thin white coating. Uh, there's no tooth mark. It doesn't look puffy. The earlier, so that greasy, horrible looking uh, right. coat on that tongue would suggest what? Suggesting there are um, digestion issues. There yeah. are things that are not being processed efficiently. They've been accumulating in the body. It creates the dampness, the right, so coating. So kind of a toxin that interferes. A Chinese concept of dampness interferes with the normal functioning of the digestive energies. That's right. So yeah. the other sign would be a lot of bloating, and also you see the tongue being really swollen, yep. has a lot of a, a coating, and even some people, they're constantly clearing their throat, or they're waking up feeling there's something at their throat. Right. Those are all signs of dampness. Not processing That's right. digestively that's very well. So that, that's a good clue. If we could go to our next slide. Uh, Arthur, maybe you could tell us about a leaky gut. The slide on our left is of a, a healthy... Uh, a wall of the intestine filtering through nutrients into the blood. And on the right, we see an unhealthy where the gates from the intestine into the blood are larger, and that's allowing through uh, partially digested food particles from the, from the intestines into the blood. Now, these particles, these, uh, they shouldn't be in the blood, and they, they're now found, I believe, it, it, in, you know, there were studies showing that in rheumatoid arthritis that they were showing uh, some of these partially digested food particles collected in the joints, and they had no reason to understand that, why that was happening. H how, how does that happen? What, what are some of the causes? You know, anti I hear antibiotics, uh, uh, hormonal treatments also interfere with, with the intestinal functioning. Why is it becoming so pre pre prevalent these days, Arthur, that this information's coming through? Well, the antibiotics, you don't have to be placed on a specific course of antibiotics to have exposure to them. It's, it's in most of our mm -hmm. animal protein, dairy, meat, these animals, uh, uh, beef are treated with, even uh, poultry uh, is beginning to have antibiotics. And as you mentioned before, some of the fish farming uses it. So we have low-grade antibiotics all along. This affects the nature, the balance of our uh, bacteria in the large intestine. And when they get out of hand, pathogens grow, fungi, yeast are more likely to grow because they don't have the good uh, bacteria to suppress them and they start producing this physiologic damage. It's not anatomic, you can't see anything on a colonoscopy, but it makes the uh, line, the mucosa, the lining cells of the large and small intestine leaky. So the protective ability of the good bacteria is depleted and that allows the walls of the intestine to be attacked and the, these gates to widen. Right. And we can test for this. We have permeability studies of very simple tests. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when this happens, studies have shown that as many as 40% of all Americans have this, and this can be the underlying factor in many, many chronic diseases of the immune system. You mentioned well, rheumatoid actually, maybe arthritis. Maybe we can bring up our, our next slide now. It shows the uh, connection to allergies, you know, to a sluggish liver not breaking down hormones very well, or immune deficiencies. Candida being an overgrowth of a bad yeast due to depleted uh, probiotics, uh, uh, good bacteria in, in, in the body. And then the autoimmune diseases of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. Now these are being suggested for fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, thyroiditis. What's the connection between leaky gut and some of these very uh, different types of problems? For some of these diseases, the connection is very obvious. <coughs> the rheumatologic, the uh, joint diseases, and the autoimmune, we see uh, what's called uh, immune complexes, uh, the partially digested, especially proteins that leak in, are uh, treated by the body as foreign proteins, and you, 
get an immunologic reaction which produces inflammation and they localize in many different tissue sites, one being the joints. You can, you can show this, that this is also an effect in most of the autoimmune disease from thyroid autoimmune to lupus, scleroderma. For the other diseases, the liver, they're not as obvious, but we do know a tremendous amount of energy depletion of the immune system is involved in these autoimmune complexes. And I should say it's not just the autoimmune complexes, but what leaks in also is the organisms themselves. And this has been shown. This has been cultured out of joints. Some of these anaerobic the bacteria that grow without oxygen, the pathogenic uh, bacteria in the gut. Uh, so the organisms themselves can also cause direct insidious sort of stealth infections. And these are also the overlap, some of the stealth infections that we think cause heart disease. So all of this kind of evidence, this building around leaky gut, has it grown strong enough where conventional medicine takes it seriously? Unfortunately, I think not. I think the, uh, although this was discovered, as far as I know, by physicians in the 60s, rheumatoid arthritis, the concept has not caught on. Yeah. It's not used much. And uh, so this, this concept of the leaky gut, of digestion not being efficient in the intestines, how is that approached acupuncture and herbs? How, how might you look at that for well, treatment? For example, uh, some irritable bowel syndrome, they present a lot of bloating and gassy. That just means a lack of a smooth movement. So what we use is that, um, you know, acupuncture especially to promote better circulation at the intestine. And uh, uh, of course, we have to uh, make suggestion on the eating, you know, eating regularly, small portion. If it's uh, constipation, we uh, promote better fiber intake. If it's uh, if it's uh, diarrhea, we uh, promote better cooked vegetable that's water-soluble fiber. Um, so there's a lot that you could do by teaching someone about how to eat more, effic you know, more efficiently for their digestive problem, basically. Definitely. Once, um, you know, with acupuncture, you know, promote better circulation, you're sort of supporting the uh, energetics of the intestine. So then you're... So if the intestine doesn't have much energy, it's not going to move through and process well. That's right. And especially with herb, and uh, when things are stuck in uh, one area for a long time, especially if it's waste, even good nutrition, if it's stuck in one place, not being moved, it eventually become toxin. So there will be creating irritation to the intestine walls. And uh, we have many herbs like what you talk about, turmeric is very good anti-inflammatory, clearing the heat or the inflammation at the intestine. And uh, then once uh, that one stage is um, passed, become uh, non-flare-up stage, we can using herb to support the digestion ability to, uh, you know, uh, to be more efficient, better moved, uh, better absorbed. Yeah. Uh, and this can be measured now, can it not, Arthur, the improvement that Yuan Ling is talking about with intestinal permeability test. How, how does that work? How does that test? That test, uh, we're given uh, a drink consisting of uh, one sugar called lactulose, another one called mannitol, one of which is not supposed to be absorbed, the other one is. Uh, when you have a leaky gut, both are absorbed. If you also have a disease in which there's uh, a prevention of most things from being absorbed, like celiac disease, uh, you'll see a deficiency in absorption of both. So we, we collect the urine for six hours and we measure these two sugars in the urine yeah. and we can determine what's going on. So the idea of uh, repeated use of antibiotics killing off the good bacteria and the good bacteria protecting the intestine is, is, a, is a mechanism how repeated antibiotics can damage intestinal permeability. And then you have corticosteroids. How does corticosteroids over time uh, be a cause of, of uh, leaky gut? Right. Well, the corticosteroids, it's not known exactly, but they're thought to interfere with the immune system of the gut. The, uh, 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 certain white cells which help to regulate the uh, abundance of certain bacteria in addition to the beneficial bacteria. Also, I should say that uh, the more common use of uh, uh, Advil, Aleve, what yeah. we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, directly causes leaky gut. And, uh, but most of the leaky gut that we see, when you say 40% of people, you're talking about over 100 million people, it's probably caused by uh, the dietary imbalance, of too much right. refined sugar, too much animal protein and fat. Yeah, and uh, 
just to uh, t tie up very quickly, H. pylori. We hear more and more about H. pylori infecting the stomach. The, this is a bad bacteria growth, right, in, 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 into the stomach. Yeah. And that, that's something that you see commonly and can treat also? Oh, yes. There are some very, very good herbs. Uh, I might add that the, uh, the standard medical treatment is very hard on the body. Yeah. It's two antibiotics, uh, for very high doses, prolonged period of time. They themselves cause similar cheek gastrointestinal symptoms. So we have things like mastic gum yeah. and several other things. And mastic is very interesting because, as you know, mastic is a, a gum, especially uh, Pistillensis lentinosa, which is a, uh, from an island of Chios, a very specific kind of tree. The sap from that tree is extremely antibacterial, but it's also extremely anti-H. pylori. And that's been proven in some studies to be more efficient at killing off H. pylori in the stomach than antibiotics. And then when you combine that with, you know, potentially it's reinfected from the dental plaque, that when you can combine that with a mouthwash or uh, a mastic toothpaste, as well as with capsules, that that is a herbal protocol that's been proven to be more efficient than the, the conventional protocol at yeah. this time. So generally speaking, we, today we've covered irritable bowel, uh, uh, leaky gut, and uh, H. pylori, which are areas that complementary and alternative medicine is very successful in. Would you say that in your practice that you've done quite well with those three areas? Well, I, I must say, honestly speaking, that uh, most of the progress that's made in these areas is in holistic medicine. I don't think these diseases are particularly well treated or treated successfully at all yeah. in the Western medical approach. Yeah. Is that your experience too? That's correct. You know and I mean? uh, it's also, I think, our um, holistic um, way we are teaching the patient how to live better. When you have living with a gastrointestinal diseases, it's not only that it, uh, itself. It wears down your energy, yeah. you fatigue, insomnia, there are many. And uh, when, when your body being constantly on that kind of stress and uh, the quality of life are very poor. So we're teaching people not only using our you know, natural way, way that our body can heal itself, uh, have a better, promote better function of it yeah. itself. We are also teaching uh, patients how to, you know, live better, how to have a better quality of life and better wellness. Right, so then just, just to sum up, the idea of acupuncture and herbs and holistic approaches and also some, some you know, uh, uh, good rationales for testing, you know, intestinal permeability can be a huge benefit to someone facing irritable bowel, H. pylori infection, and, and leaky gut, and all of the varying symptoms that, that those three things uh, produce. So Yuan Ling Liu, acupuncturist, uh, herbalist, and uh, registered dietitian at the Darcy Wellness Clinic, thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Arthur Gertler, medical doctor, holistic physician, also at the Darcy Wellness Clinic. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank and you. thank you very much for joining us today. We hope that we've offered you some holistic, uh, complementary and alternative options that are non-drug and non-surgically orientated for the natural treatment of, uh, of, your, of any gastrointestinal diseases. So thank you very much for joining the Darcy Wellness Show and we wish you all the very best for your health. <laughs>